Save American lives. Brother. Save American lives. Have a good Civilian deaths. Terrorism. 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 What? High tech. Small drones that can fit in a soldier's backpack 
Now there's all kinds of drones. There's drones that, uh, surveillance drones that look like a, a hummingbird. They're actually modeled after nature. They look like a wasp or a bee or a hummingbird. Um, they can be flying outside your window and you would think it was a beautiful bird. Uh, there are drones that soldiers can put in their backpacks and send out to scout, as somebody said. Um, and then there are drones that are not used for military purposes at all. There's drones used for tracking endangered species. There's drones that are used for uh, trying to pinpoint forest fires. It only means that it's a uh, of something that flies, that has a camera in it, that is relaying this information back to the person who is uh, manipulating the drone, and uh, can be weaponized, doesn't have to be weaponized. So I think that uh, in some ways, uh, while I put out the word to you, what is a drone, uh, a lot of people have this impression of killing. Uh, the majority of drones that will probably be used in the next 10, 20 years will be drones that might deliver your pizza to you, uh, deliver your UPS package, replace all kinds of messengers, uh, be used by people in the uh, weather prediction, in the journalist field, uh, people in real estate who want to get a view. Oh, and the, the number one commercial use of drones they expect will be for farmers. So I am focusing on the drones for killing and spying. Uh, in terms of those drones, the most common one is a Predator and Reaper drone made by a company in Southern California called General Atomics. And it is uh, this, this drone that you see up here. Um, where are we using these drones? We're using them in, use them in Iraq, in Afghanistan, uh, but also in places where we are not technically at war. And that's uh, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, the Philippines. Uh, a question we have to ask is, who is getting killed by those drones? Well, we would like to know that, but our government hasn't told us. Uh, this is a secret program that's run by the most secret parts of our government, like the CIA, or within the military, what's called the Joint Special Operations Command. Uh, anybody here in the military? One, two. Well, you know, the military is training, and the Air Force especially, more pilots for uh, drone pilots than traditional pilots to be uh, in the cockpit. Um, the pilots for the drones don't even have to go anywhere near the battlefield. They are here in the United States. They are in uh, Air Force bases. Uh, they are in places like Creech Air Force Base outside of Las Vegas, upstate New York. Um, they can really be anywhere because this is all being done remotely. They are sitting at, uh, in rooms that are air conditioned, they're sitting in ergonomic chairs, uh, they are 10, 12 hours a day sometimes watching a video screen and looking at something that is 8,000 miles away. I mean, it is pretty amazing technology to think that you could be following an individual uh, 8,000 miles away. And the drone pilots are uh, we find that there is about as high a level of PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, as there is for soldiers in the battlefield. Because uh, it turns out that it's very hard for a pilot, remote pilot, to be sitting in this room during the day watching the screen and in a very surreal kind of way getting to know the family because the drones don't just come in and out. The drones hop. The whole drones stay in one place for long periods of time. And uh, so they might be watching a particular family for a week at a time, two weeks at a time, watching how the father is playing with the children, watching the mother doing the laundry, watching the kids go off to school, and developing a kind of strange relationship with this family. And then they're told to press the button. And drop that hellfire whistle. 
So a lot of these pilots are finding that it's hard to do that during the day and then go home at night to your family and be a good father, a good husband, coach the soccer team, and not be thinking about what you did during the day. So um, it is a, a strange thing that we are asking people to do. Uh, while it certainly does save the lives of, of pilots and, and soldiers, uh, on the other hand, it does bring up all kinds of ethical and moral issues. And since this lecture tonight is about <coughs> ethics, I think it's important to reflect upon the new way of making war in which we don't put our own people at risk. Uh, and one of the biggest problems of it is that we are then increasing the potential for civilian casualties on the ground in order to keep our own people safe. So that's something that hopefully we can, we can talk about. Um, and I say this because when you look at who has been killed, um, we have not been told the numbers, but sometimes some of our elected people blurt out things. So uh, the Senator uh, Lindsey Graham, who was on the Intelligence Committee, once said that we killed 4,700 people with drones. Uh, and he wasn't including Afghanistan. We don't know what those numbers are. But we do know that there is a kill list that President Obama comes up with, and that only 2% of the people who have been killed have been on that kill list, meaning only 2% have been high-level Al-Qaeda <coughs> people. So who are the vast majority of people who have been killed by the drones? Low-level people? Innocent people? Um, the administration says that any male of military age who lives in the areas where we are using the drones is a militant. So raise your hand if you're a male of military age. A lot of you right So just think about your counterparts in a place like Yemen or in the tribal areas in, in Pakistan. You would, no matter what you did or didn't do, be considered fair game in terms of killing you with a drone. I mean, we talk a lot about the issues of racial profiling in this country, but I think the, the way that we are using these drones is a pretty grotesque example of racial profiling. Uh, racial profiling. So there are two kinds of drone strikes. One is this thing that I mentioned to you in the kill list, and uh, let's see, raise your hand if you have a beard here. Obama came in, he had campaigned that he was going to close down 
certainly putting them into Guantanamo would have looked bad. So they sat around and they really decided that it was easier to just kill people. And that's why the number of drone strikes has gone way up. Now, I say this not because I don't like President Obama or I like President Obama. It really has very little to do with that. These are policy issues. And we find out that uh, sometimes, whether it's a Democrat or Republican in the White House, when it comes to foreign policy issues, um, there is a very similar pattern that happens, which is using the military as a response uh, and having a very weak alternative of capturing people, giving them fair trials, that kind of thing. So President Obama comes in and the drone strikes go way up. Well, I had been to Pakistan and met with this man here who is a photographer who risked his life to go out and take pictures of drone strikes. Now raise your hand if you've ever seen a picture of a drone strike with you. So very few of you. The person way in the back there, where have you seen this? Um, it was from a, a peace action group. And uh, raise your hand if you've ever seen a picture of a drone strike victim in a mainstream newspaper over TV. So look around, because there is not one hand raised. And that's pretty extraordinary. When you kill thousands of people, that means you wounded a lot of people as well. And we've never seen a picture. Now, one reason you haven't seen a picture is because when the Hellfire missile hits its target, um, most of the time, the person is vaporized. They just disappear. The impact is so strong. And this guy, uh, this photographer here, tells us that most of the time when he goes to an area that was hit by a drone, all you find is pieces of flesh on the ground, in the trees. You don't know if the flesh is from an animal, from a person, a young person, an old person, a woman, a man. And he said, uh, it is horrible enough that people lose their loved ones. And then to add on to that, they can't even give them a decent Muslim burial because you can't even find body parts. Now, there are a lot of people who get killed because they are hit by the shrapnel or the debris that goes flying. And those are some of the pictures that this man takes. And these are pictures, again, that we don't see on the TV. Um, there are names of 178 children in Pakistan who've been killed by the drones. And uh, we don't see the photos, we don't hear their names, we don't hear about their lives. So when I went to Pakistan, I had a chance to talk to some of the people whose loved ones had been killed. This, for example, is a man who is a uh, journalist. He was away from his home, got a call in the middle of the night um, on uh, New Year's Eve 2009 and told that a drone had just struck his home and destroyed the whole house. And killed in the house that night were his son and his uh, brother. And what this man, Kareem Khan, said is that his son and his brother were actually teachers in the local school. And when the Taliban came into their uh, area, um, the son and the brother thought it was so important to keep teaching because they wanted to uh, teach the students in the village that education was much more powerful than a weapon. And they shouldn't join a group like the Taliban. <coughs> And he said, imagine the kind of lesson that was learned that night that their beloved teachers were killed in a U.S. drone strike. He also said that the 300 students were left aching for revenge against the country that sent in that drone. And this is something we heard over and over again. You know, some of you might know, and most of you probably don't, that uh, I managed to get into the hall when President Obama was giving his main foreign policy address on May 23rd at the National Defense uh, University. And I got in there, and I can't divulge how I got in there, but I did. And I got in there, and I was, um, I had just come back from Pakistan and Yemen. So, um, I 
I was listening very carefully about what the president was saying about his foreign policy. And he said that uh, drones were only used as a last resort, that the first option was to try to capture people. Well, I had just heard so many stories from families saying that just was not true. And one of those stories I heard was about this young man, uh, Terry Gaziz, a 16-year-old, uh, who was very upset about the drones because his 12-year-old cousin had been killed by one. And so he was invited to the capital city of Islamabad to meet with about 80 other family members who lost people to drones to say, well, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to try to use the court system to get some kind of redress? And they also said that in this area where they live, journalists are not allowed in. So how are they going to get more information out to the world? They said, all right, let's get video cameras and train some of the young people how to use them and get the messages out. So he was very anxious to do that. He got trained during this week that he was in the capital. How to use a video, given a video to take back to his village. The first documentation was his own death that happened two days later. And this is all that is left of Tariq Aziz, 16-year-old boy. So the lawyers who were at that meeting were furious and went to the U.S. Embassy and said, why did you kill this young man? And they said, he was a militant. And the lawyer said, well, first of all, he's 16 years old. He, uh, where is the, the proof? How could the 16-year-old be a high-level Al-Qaeda person who is a, uh, a trying to kill somebody uh, in the United States? It doesn't make sense. And second of all, he was in the capital city for an entire week in a public place. Why didn't you just come in and arrest him and give him a chance to be charged and tried? And the U.S. representatives had no response for that because that is pretty much the way that they have been dealing with things in that part of Pakistan. So uh, I got up during the president's speech and started speaking out on behalf of some of these uh, drone victims and said uh, that it is just not true that drones are used as a last resort. That um, these drones are actually killing a lot of innocent people and turning a lot of people against the United States. And what we heard while we visited these areas is that it's not just about who gets killed or who gets hurt by the drones or property that's destroyed. It's also that these drones are actually terrorizing entire populations. And this is something that I added to the updated version of my book, which is uh, here for anybody who'd like to get a copy afterwards, uh, because it's a, a very important aspect that was documented by two law schools, Stanford University and NYU law schools, who did a study and corroborated what we heard anecdotally while we were there, which said that since the drones hover overhead and they make a buzzing noise and they fly low and people can see them, this is terrorizing entire populations. Because uh, they say to us it's like having a, a bee inside your head that's constantly buzzing and that you always think that drone is after you. And it's going to attack you somewhere, whether on purpose or by mistake, you're going to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, because the drones have hit schools, making kids afraid to go to school. The drones have been used to kill people in the middle of the night, making kids afraid to go to sleep at night, a lot of bedwetting among children. Uh, the drones have made people afraid to congregate in places like funerals or weddings or community gatherings. And people told us that in our war on terror, we are terrorizing entire populations. Well, this is making people very angry. And in a place like Pakistan, you'll find that three out of four Pakistanis have said they consider the United States their enemy. And when the foreign minister was asked why, she had a one-word answer, and that was drones. Um, and the Pakistanis have been protesting on the streets, blocking a U.S. base, uh, trying to bring the U.S. Uh, to court, uh, bringing the head of the CIA to court in Pakistan. They've been trying through all kinds of venues uh, to say this is just counterproductive.
it is actually creating a justification for terrorism. And the same policy that has been so counterproductive in Pakistan is now being used in Yemen. And some people have called it a whack-a-mole policy because you hit the extremists in Afghanistan, they move to Pakistan, you hit them in Pakistan, they go to Yemen, you're hitting them in Yemen, now they're going to North Africa. Um, it is not a solution. It's just moving the problem around. Uh, in the case of Yemen, this has been where the U.S. thinks is the center of activity now for Al-Qaeda. And so the number of drone strikes in Yemen has gone up tremendously since 2009. Well, for anybody who doesn't know where Yemen is, it's a small country that's in the uh, southern part of the Arabian Peninsula. And we went to visit there and uh, found that it was a, a very beautiful country, a very old civilization. Uh, in fact, the capital of Yemen is a UNESCO heritage site. Uh, it's very beautiful. You can hear, see here some of the old city. It's a very conservative culture. Most of the women go around uh, covered like this. Uh, this is the men's traditional dress, which is kind of uh, beautiful. And um, <coughs> what we found there was similar to Pakistan, uh, people who were very angry because of the use of drones. So this man that you see here, uh, you can kind of see in his eyes. Well, tell me what you see in his face. Anger. Anger. Distraught. Distraught. Sadness. Sadness. So this is a man who uh, comes from one of the uh, very large tribes in, in uh, Yemen, not far from the capital city. And he came in to tell us about what happened to his family. And this is uh, his brother was a school teacher by day and then also on his free time to make some extra money would drive a taxi. And here is the proof he brought us that he was a school teacher. And he said one day he was driving a taxi, he picked up some people he didn't know, which is what taxi drivers do all the time. And 10 minutes later, the taxi was blown up by a U.S. drone. Now, he also brought with him the, his brother's children, who would never know their father again. He said he tried to bring his brother's wife, but she was so distraught uh, that she was not able to come, and she spends her days just sobbing and sobbing. Uh, he did bring a piece of the Hellfire missile to show that this was indeed from the United States. And he told us that uh, in his tribal culture, if you commit a crime or a terrible mistake, that you have to do something about it. That you have to atone for your mistake, you have to provide some kind of redress. And we said, well, what would that be? And he said, well, first of all, you have to acknowledge that you did this. Second of all, you have to apologize for what you did. And third, you have to offer some kind of compensation to the family. He said, we haven't been able to even get the U.S. government to acknowledge that they killed my brother, who had nothing to do with extremism. He said, could it be that my tribal culture is more evolved when it comes to justice than the justice system of the United States of America, the most powerful country in the world? We also got a chance to meet with this young man, Farah Al-Muslimi, who actually had a chance to come to the United States and testify in front of Congress which was quite remarkable because it was the first time ever since the use of drones that we actually heard from somebody who lived in a country where the drones were being used. Now this is a 23 year old young man who loves the United States. He was from a very poor family, uh, 11 children in the family, but he got a chance through a State Department grant to come to the United States when he was in high school and spend a year here. And he said it was like he won the lottery. It changed his life forever. He learned to speak really beautiful English. He learned to write really well. Uh, his uh, uh, father, the, the, the family that he stayed with was in the Air Force, and it became like his, uh, his dad. And he went back to his village in Yemen, and it was like he was an ambassador for the United States. And he said he became a journalist. And as he did his journalist work, he found what was happening with these drones. And he started to uh, write about it and meet with families. And then he was asked, 
this drone did in an instant, the extremists were never able to do, and that is turn the entire village against the United States. And it became so bad that Ara is afraid to go back to his own village. In fact, when we saw him in Yemen, he said he was going to have to leave the country because he was so identified as being somebody who loved the United States that he was afraid then for his own safety. I want to tell you this uh, story because it's so different. This is the story of, um, uh, we were invited into this young woman's home. She uh, was studying English. She wants to be a teacher. She also likes the United States very much. And unlike so many of the other stories where they said, my loved one had nothing to do with extremism, was in the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, I was kind of shocked when there was, we were sitting there with this young woman and her mother and her father. She said, my three brothers all joined Al-Qaeda. And we were like, wow, that's kind of shocking. We're in the home of somebody who's three brothers joined Al-Qaeda. Please tell us how this happened. And she started telling the story. And her brothers were like 17, 18, uh, 19 years old. This was during the dictatorship in their country. Uh, the youngest brother got thrown into jail, was treated horribly in jail <coughs> during the dictatorship, was tortured, hated his government, uh, got out and said, what can I do to get back? And he found this group that he knew nothing about called Al-Qaeda. And when she was telling the story, she said, my brother got in with the wrong people. And it sounded like people here in the U.S. joining a gang, like a young person joining a gang. And I have children of my own, and uh, minor girls, but certainly a lot of their friends who were boys got in with the wrong people. And it suddenly occurred to us that we are killing 17-year-olds, 18-year-olds, uh, who really needed some re-education, rehabilitation, uh, job opportunities, uh, some prospects for their future, not to be killed by a U.S. drone. And um, lastly, I wanted to mention the story of a young American boy who was killed by a U.S. drone. Raise your hand if you've heard of the story about the al Awlaki family. So, some of you have. Well, in this case, there was a father who was a preacher, an imam, and he was a mild preacher in the United States. In fact, he had been invited to the Pentagon and the White House. And after 9-11, he started to get radicalized when he saw the U.S. Uh, involvement in Iraq, when he saw the pictures of the uh, abuse of prisoners in Abu Ghraib, when he saw what was happening in Guantanamo, he got more and more radical. And he went back to his family's home in Yemen. He took his uh, family with him. And he started to preach against the United States to laud those who were attacking Americans. And perhaps, we haven't seen the evidence, uh, perhaps to get involved himself in some kind of operations to try to kill Americans. He was put on a kill list, and he was killed uh, by the CIA. Well, two weeks later, his son was at an outdoor restaurant eating with some of his teenage friends. And the whole group of them were killed by a drone. We met with the grandfather and, um, while we were in Yemen. And the grandfather had just written a beautiful op-ed in the New York Times, which was basically saying, I want to know why my grandson was killed. Um, I want to know why the U.S. government thinks it has a right to kill a 16-year-old American citizen. And again, not even uh, uh, say, um, was it a mistake? Was it on purpose? And the, because he is an American citizen, um, there was a lawsuit brought in the courts trying to get some kind of acknowledgement from the U.S. government about the killing of an American citizen. Well, the Attorney General Eric Holder was asked about this, and uh, he said, he was asked if American citizens
citizens by the uh, virtue of being a U.S. citizen, didn't we have the right to a judicial process, to be accused of something, to be uh, charged with something, to have a trial? And amazingly enough, he said that, no, American citizens don't have the right to a judicial process. Uh, we only have something called due process. And by that he meant that the U.S., uh, the, the executive branch, President Obama, uh, talked about this case, brought it up, and decided to kill him. So I looked around for all the constitutional lawyers to see after that, wasn't there an outcry within the legal community? But the best response I saw did not come from constitutional lawyers, but came from a late night comedian called Stephen Colbert. <laughs> and Colbert said, yes, the founding fathers weren't picky. Trial by jury, trial by fire, rock, paper, scissors, who cares? Due process just means there is a process that you do. <laughs> the current process is that the president meets with his advisor, decides who to kill, and then kills them. If we are ever going to win our never-ending war against terror, says Colbert, there are bound to be casualties, and one of them just happens to be the U.S. Constitution. <laughs> so let's hear it for Stephen Colbert. <laughs> so as I lay out in this book with lots of different arguments, I think the U.S. is setting forth to the rest of the world a model saying we can go anywhere we want, kill anybody we want, on the basis of secret information. Well, some people might think that's okay because the U.S. is the only one that has this technology, but this is just not true. In fact, this technology is spreading very quickly. And here is a map showing the countries that are getting drones. Um, the U.S. companies, you know, they want to sell their uh, technology. They are selling them overseas. Um, but the U.S. is not the number one seller of drones. The number one seller of drones is Israel, which is selling drones to over 50 countries right now. And then, of course, there's the Chinese who see a multi-billion dollar business and say, aha, we're going to produce those drones faster and cheaper than anybody else. And they've gotten into the market in a big way, and they are producing dozens of kinds of drones, even through cyber war, getting copies of U.S. drones and then replicating them. So there is a full-fledged arms race with drones right now. And it will not be long before other countries start using these drones as well. And um, there is a very strong lobby in the United States of drone manufacturers. And when they want to do things like change laws so they can sell more drones, uh, they do it the good old American way, which is they pay money to a lot of political uh, uh, Congress people, and these Congress people then do their bidding in Congress. And so they've created a drone caucus, Republicans and Democrats in this, and these people think they were elected by the U.S. public to help proliferate drones both overseas and here in the United States. <coughs> so the drone manufacturers are worried because they see the war in Iraq ending, the war in Afghanistan is supposed to wind down. Uh, they want more markets, and they're looking internally. Well, there's a problem, which is these drones are not very safe. They crash all the time. I have a lot of examples in the book uh, of how they crash and why they crash. But the Federal Aviation Administration that is in charge of our airspace is very worried about our safety. They don't want these drones crashing with a commercial airplane. And so they <coughs> wanted to go very slowly about authorizing the use of drones here in the United States. But the lobby wants them to go quickly and open up the airspace. So they force through a piece of legislation in Congress that says U.S. airspace has to be opened up to drones by September of 2015. So we are in the midst right now of a lot of experimentation with permits being given out to a couple of hundred different groups to experiment with the use of drones to get us ready for what will be tens of thousands of drones in our airspace. Who are getting these experimental permits?
departments, the FBI, Homeland Security, Border Patrol, uh, some companies, some universities, uh, and the bottom one here I think we should pay attention to is the police departments. Because the drone manufacturers see that there are 18,000 police departments in the United States and they think this is a fabulous market for us. And you know, it's part of the militarization of the police in the United States. And if you haven't seen it here, you really see it in a lot of big cities where the police are getting uh, equipped. They look like military. There are actually tanks that are in some of the, the, the streets in some of our big cities. And this is an example. It's not even a big city. This is a sheriff's department outside of Houston that has uh, their SWAT team. And the SWAT team has the big tank, and they got a grant from Homeland Security to buy uh, one of these uh, smaller drones right here. And they said, well, we're going to use it for search and rescue missions, we'll use it for all kinds of you know, good things. But they did brag at a press conference that this drone could be weaponized. But the funny thing about this is that when they went to the press conference to show off their new drone, and were manipulating it up in the air, and it was going around, and they were very proud of it, and then crashed right into the tank. <laughs> <laughs> they probably went to Homeland Security and said, we need a bigger and better drone. Um, so there are uh, a lot of people around the country who are worried about not only the issues of safety, but they're worried about the issues of privacy. Uh, and I think it was you, right? You brought up the Fourth Amendment. Right. And why did you bring up the Fourth Amendment? Because it's a vision of privacy. And the Fourth Amendment is what? Um, the right to... Um, <laughs> the, the, the right of people to be secure in the first place. I can't pass this. No, but you're Thanks. totally right. And, and the main issue is you're supposed to be able to have a certain uh, certainty of privacy of your privacy without due cause. And uh, so people are very worried about this. And this is people that range from uh, farmers who don't want the EPA flying over their uh, farms to see what they're doing to marijuana growers who don't want the government uh, flying over. Because you know, there's also heat sensors. You can tell, even if you're growing marijuana in your house, which might be worth something to your
to talk about both the drones being used overseas uh, to kill people and the drones being used home to spying. Uh, and interestingly, that man that I showed you when I said, what do you see on his face? And people said anger and sorrow. Uh, he said something very profound, which is, he said, um, you no, know, I'm so surprised because I always thought that America was a model of democracy. And when I see what the United States is doing, uh, I think they are using us in Yemen as guinea pigs that they are trying out this technology on us. They are perfecting this technology on us. And he said, if Americans don't care that poor people of color, like his family, are being killed by US drones and many times by the state, they should care that these drones will probably come back to haunt you in the United States. And if you think about it, we are already an over-surveilled society, as we found out, thanks to the NSA revelations of the uh, whistleblower Edward Snowden. But if we have drones, this can take it to a whole different level. The ACLU says we could become a 24-7 surveillance society, because there could be drones that you don't see, drones that you see, and this could be watching people all the time, and especially people in communities like black community, the Muslim community, the Latino community, the immigrant community, uh, the environmentalists, the peace community. Um, the college community. What? The college community. The college community. Anybody else? <laughs> so um, I want to end by um, two things. One is to tell you that there is a vibrant movement now to bring some kind of control over the use of the drones. And this is very exciting to me because when I started the book, um, people didn't know about drones because our government wouldn't even admit that it was using them. And now there is a big discussion about them. And we've already had a lot of success on many different levels. One success has really been around public opinion because in February of 2012, when there was a, a public polled up in the United States, it said that 83% of the American people thought it was okay to use drones to kill terrorist suspects. And I was really appalled at that because it was the majority of Republicans, majority of Democrats, independents, majority of people called themselves liberal Democrats. And if, if that same poll that was taken uh, about six months ago show that about 60% now say that. And when it comes to women, the majority of women are against the use of drones, against terror suspects. So public opinion is changing rapidly, and that's very important because it does have an influence on policy. And it's already had an influence on policy. Because when I started this work, there were a lot of innocent people that were getting killed. There were drones that were being uh, dropped on people's homes in the middle of the night that would kill the children and the women, as well as the individual that was being targeted. Um, today, I still think that the drones are being used in ways that should not be used. But I do see that there is more care taken these days. Uh, in fact, um, one thing that we see is the number of drone strikes going down, the number of uh, civilians being killed going down. And you might have no noticed in the news just this week, uh, there were US raids in both Somalia, uh, in, in, um, in, both in, in uh, Somalia and Libya. Uh, this brought up the question of why were US Navy SEALs sent in instead of drones? And one of the reasons given is uh, they didn't want to risk the civilian casualties using drones. So policy is changing. Not enough. I think drones have to be taken out of the hands of the CIA. The CIA is not a military organization, shouldn't have drones. There are people in the military who really agree with us on this and are trying to get the drones out of the hands of the CIA. Uh, they say in the military there's more accountability, there's more transparency. Uh, we also think that it should be illegal to do those signature strikes that I mentioned where you kill people just on the basis of suspicious behavior. Uh, and um, a number of changes in policy still should be made. We are working at the grassroots level and we are working at the international level at the level of the, of the United Nations. 
I did send around that sign-up sheet. Did everybody, I, I wanted to ask you to sign up because um, we always send out information for most once a week, but it's important information and gives you ideas of things that you can do to help rein in the policies. And I wonder if there anybody who didn't get a chance to sign up that would like to. So uh, maybe on the, on the way out, you can come sign up here. And thank you for those who did sign up. Um, so let me just end with one uh, story, which is about our time in Pakistan. We went to Pakistan because we wanted to meet with the drone strike victims. And uh, we were told immediately, and this was a group of 34 individuals. It was almost as if I said to you all, anybody want to join? And probably you would think, what crazy people would want to go to Pakistan? No risk, uh, no guarantee that it would be safe. Uh, but 34 Americans, crazy Americans, did. Uh, we got to Pakistan. We met with the U.S. ambassador there who said, You shouldn't be here, but don't go out in the streets. And we said, We came here to be very visible. In fact, tomorrow we're going out on the streets. And we were out on the streets every day doing uh, vigils, doing uh, walks for peace. We were on the newspapers, on the television every day. And then the last thing we wanted to do before we left was to go up to the tribal areas. Now that is very dangerous. And the U.S. ambassador sent his security people and said, please do not go up to those areas. That we have credible information that um, they, that, uh, the Taliban are going to try to kill you. Uh, they said, uh, we heard that they're going to strap explosives on donkeys and elephants and send them out into the crowd. Well, I did not take this lightly as somebody who organized this delegation, and I actually tried to convince the delegation that we had done enough, um, that we didn't need to take that kind of risk. And amazingly, the delegation said, we came this far, we really want to go to that area because those people don't have the choice, the luxury that we do, of sending out the paralyzer. They are caught between the extremism of the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and the drone strikes. And we want to go there and express our uh, sympathy to innocent people who are caught in the middle. And so we decided to go. And I must say that when we got up very close and we spent the night, I did not sleep a week that night. And the next morning we got out and uh, we were to address a rally. We were mostly women. Not all women, but mostly women. Um, we're a feminist group, Code Pink. And imagine we get out there, we see the sea of men. And of course, we're looking everywhere for the donkeys and the camels. <laughs> Thank goodness we did not see. But we didn't know how we would be received. And we uh, got out into this crowd. And uh, I was addressing the crowd on behalf of the delegation. And we started hearing this roar going up in the crowd. And we didn't know what they were saying until we finally figured it out, and they were saying, welcome, 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 we want peace, we want peace. And it was so beautiful. And then we started saying, and every time I would say something, it would get translated into Pashtun, and you hear a roar going up in the crowd, and we said, you know, we came all the way from the United States, and uh, we were told not to come here, that she would not receive us well. Uh, but we thought it was important. We have a list of 178 children from this area who were killed by our girls. And um, many of us are mothers, and we want to express our sorrows to the parents of these children and to say that we feel that your children are as precious as our own children and that we will do everything we can when we go back home to change our government's policy. And uh, afterwards, people came up and told us that if we had come there to win their hearts and minds, we won their hearts and minds. An elderly Pashtun man who came up with a turban and a beard and a gun slung over his shoulder came up and said, um, you have done more for the positive image of Americans than the millions of dollars that your government throws at our government every year. And um, what we felt with that trip is that there are so many people around the world who want to love America. They don't want to hate us. And sure, there are extremist groups. There are people who want to do us harm. And I certainly believe that our military should do everything it can to protect us. But protect us basically here in the United States and at our embassies. Protect us not to be going out and using something like the drones that kill so many innocent people that it creates more enemies. And they said to us, we haven't seen Americans here in 10 years. But 
but what we have seen is predator drones, reaper drones, hellfire missiles, death and destruction. And what do you think you will reap in return? You will reap hellfire. You will reap death and destruction. That we have to turn this whole thing around. And I cite in the book um, a study that was done by, by the Rand Corporation with 268 groups that were called terrorist organizations. And how did they come to their demise? And the study shows that 43% came to their demise because there was better policing that was done, going after individuals using national and international policing. 43% by incorporating them into the political system, bringing them back into the fold. And only 7% were minimized through military action. We have been using military action now for over 12 years. And I think it is time for us to try a different tactic. For those of you who are young in this audience who've grown up pretty much with perpetual war, for a large portion of your lives. Uh, I want to see you live in a country that is not constantly in perpetual war, that is not spending billions and billions of dollars on a bloated military, and instead is investing that money so that education becomes affordable to you in college, so that uh, we have a healthcare system that covers everybody, um, and that we uh, start moving away from the fossil fuel treadmill that we are on into a world of uh, greener and cleaner energy, uh, we will only do that if we start using the muscle that has been so atrophied since 9-11, and that is the muscle of diplomacy and negotiated solutions. I see hope in what happened in Syria. I see hope now that we are talking to the Iranians. I see hope in that the American people are not just more weary, but we are more Wise. We see what over 11 years of war has brought. Taliban is still there, Al Qaeda is still there, and we are all poor, and uh, 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 our economy has suffered tremendously from it. So I encourage you to work for peace, to uh, buy a copy of my book to learn more so you can talk to your friends and your relatives about this, um, to sign up with us at Code Pink. <coughs>
Should Obama be forced to do that as a Nobel Peace Prize? <laughs> well, I don't think Obama should ever have gotten the Nobel Peace Prize, and I think the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, unfortunately, has been going to a lot of people over the years that don't deserve the Nobel Peace Prize. But you know, this week, uh, in fact, it's, it's going to be in the next couple of days, the Nobel Peace Prize is going to be announced. And um, some of us are rooting that it be the uh, young Pakistani woman, uh, Malala Yousafzai, who was uh, shot at by the Taliban. Uh, and some of you might have seen her on the Daily Show last night. She was quite incredible. Um, but we would like to see somebody who really deserves the Nobel Peace Prize this year. Uh, yes. Oh. Our study was Washington. 